This happened in 2014 or 2015. I'm a female and I was about 20 years old. I'll give you some context before letting you know what happened. I was studying in the lovely seaside city in France and everyone was cycling all the time. Cycling to school, to work, to parties. It was a very safe place full of tourists and students. I lived and studied in the city from 2012 to 2015. Up until the event I'm going to mention, I never felt unsafe and didn't hear anything from my friends either. In December 2014, my boyfriend took me to his engineering school's Christmas party. We were a large group of friends and mingled a lot. One of the guys from this group, whom I didn't know personally, left the party without anyone noticing. A month later, he was found dead in the harbor, and police never figured out what happened. I went online to check if there's any news, and it's still a cold case. I didn't know him, but I think about it all the time. Was it because he was alone? Did he fall? Or did someone push him? Why didn't anyone care to walk home with him? Needless to say, the city started to feel a whole lot less safe, but at 20 years old, I didn't have the same understanding of such things as I do now as a 30 year old. My life carried on. A couple of months passed and at the beginning of 2015, a friend was assaulted badly while cycling back home after a party. He was found in a critical condition, his body laying halfway on the road and halfway on the sidewalk. His head had been smashed on the sidewalk step and his jaw was completely shattered. He was a big guy in every sense possible, not the sort of guy that you could push around easily. When he was recovering in the hospital, he couldn't make sense of what happened. He had no idea why he was attacked on his bike and the police did not find any suspects. Two students my age in the same friend circles were brutally assaulted for no reason. I still cycled everywhere because I had no choice. I lived 8 kilometers away from my school and didn't have any other means of transportation. That meant I cycled approximately 16 to 20 kilometers every day and I have been doing it since 2012. Fast forward to spring 2015. I am cycling back from a party with my boyfriend. I have had a few drinks but I am not drunk, I am just tired. My boyfriend is annoying me because he's not waiting for me and the distance between us keeps getting bigger. Suddenly, someone jumps on me. He appears out of nowhere and kicks my bike to the floor. I've been cycling so much, I am so used to the bike that I let it fall between my legs, but I did not fall. I resisted and stand up. It's a man. I reach for my bike, which is now on the floor, with my left hand. I'm trying to get a hold of the handlebars. He kicks me, and then my hand. He kicks me again and again, but I'm already holding the handlebars. It hurts, but I'm lifting the bike. He says something, and I don't hear it. I see my boyfriend looking at me. He's a bit far away, but he stops cycling. He's going to help me. The man's going to see I'm not alone. I'm standing there lifting my bike. It's been maybe two or three seconds since the man jumped on me. My boyfriend is looking at me, and then he turns his back. My heart drops. He starts pedaling away. It's the dead of night and there's no one else. I'm on my own. The man keeps kicking. He wants me to let go. My hand looks blue, but my grip is strong. I think about the two other students. They give me strength. I think about my boyfriend. The sight of him cycling away filled me with pure rage. I use this rage man holding some kind of glass in his hand. I grab it with my free hand and I smash it into his face. I'm doing it. I'm furious. I'm getting the bike up. Surely the glass had alcohol in it because it burns his eyes. I have a split second to launch myself and start pedaling away. He couldn't reach my hand anymore so he kicked the bike one more time. I stand strong on the pedal. He tries to chase me but I'm faster. I pedal until I can no longer breathe. I pedal until I feel numb. 
That night, I know I escaped something terrible. Due to the stress, I can't describe the man. I'll never know for sure if my experience was linked with the other attacks. However, we were all walking and cycling on the same route. Ten years later, I can remember the look on my boyfriend's face when he turned his back on me. Let's never meet either of these two men again. My friend and I, I'll call him Robert, had just spent a day in the city a few hours away from our own. We had just spent a day at an event in which we both participated in, and we had a blast. After the event, we decided to go out and get dinner with a group of our friends and ended up staying in the city almost until midnight before we decided that we probably should get going. The drive home was very uneventful for most of the way home. The roads in between the two cities were very rural and only had a few small towns between the two. Since it was dark, we spent most of the time driving looking out for animals that may run out into the road while chatting with each other. As we got fairly close to Robert's house, we saw the car parked on the opposite side of the road facing the wrong way and a man walking around on the next side of the road. The car in front of us just happened to be an ambulance, which stopped to try to help the man. As we drove past, I made eye contact with him, and we just continued on our way thinking nothing of what just happened. We drove for another 20 to 30 minutes before turning onto an access road to get to Robert's house. As we got further up the road, we noticed another car had turned on the road further behind us. Robert lives in a gated community, so we had turned onto the driveway so we could get through the gate. This is when we noticed that the car that had turned before had turned again and was right behind us. As we pulled up to the gate, Robert opened it and drove through. The car behind us also managed to make it through just before the gate closed. Neither of us really had any thought that we were being followed until this point, but even then we joked about it. We then drove for a while inside this neighborhood, which is fairly large, and noticed the car was still behind us. The route we took was a large curve, so we figured you should have had to turn off by now. As we got close to his house, we decided to keep on going, as the road would loop around and confirm that we were being followed. At this point, we called my friend's dad, who had just watched us drive by with his car behind us. As we came around the loop, we had come to the realization that we were actually being followed. Robert then started driving much quicker through the neighborhood, and the car behind us also picked up speed. We were going about 50 to 60 miles on this fairly small road, but the other car kept up. We drove for a while before we decided to head to the front gate, which had a 24-hour security guard. We left the neighborhood, pulled a U-turn back to the front gate, we were still driving fast at this point, and to anyone it should have been apparent that we were being chased. As we came back to the front gate, my friend was able to open it in a way we couldn't be followed. But as we turned the corner, we saw the gate opening, and the car that was following us drove in. This is where we made a huge mistake. We turned down a road without realizing it's a cul-de-sac. As soon as we noticed our mistake, Robert was able to flip his car around so we could get out of there. But as we drove by the car, I made eye contact with the driver, but could barely see his face. When we turned out of the cul-de-sac, we turned off the lights and booked it. We finally had managed to shake him and get to Robert's house. We waited at Robert's house for the police to arrive, and shortly after the officer had arrived, he got a call on the radio and booked it to his car. A few minutes later, two more police showed up, and we were informed that they found the car. The man was the same guy that we passed on the side of the street around an hour earlier. When the police first made contact with him, he refused to speak to them and didn't look like he was in the right state of mind. As the traffic stop proceeded, he began threatening the officers. We later found out that he was a mentally ill and unstable veteran from a couple states over, and he had no reason to be anywhere close to where we were. The man had broken the back gate when he followed us in. 
The worst of all this is the guy at the front gate whose only job was to not let people in if they didn't have a fob without stopping at his booth let the guy in after he saw us speed past him. He was quickly fired by the security company. Looking back, there's only one thing I would have changed. I would have called the police sooner, but the adrenaline in the moment clouded our judgment. I'm a 29-year-old woman. I've lived in a big city all my life. But at the beginning of April, I moved to a medium-sized town, about an hour away from the big city, along with my sister and our four pets. This happened after a month of living here. My sister was preparing for her final presentation for her arts undergrad, which was going to be shown in the city, so she had to spend the whole day there to make her preparations. I was left home alone with our cats and dogs. So in the early evening, I decided to go for a long walk with my two dogs. We walked for like an hour, but about five minutes away from our home, as we were headed back, I saw a man knocking on a door about a block away. I thought he looked a bit weird because he would knock on the door, look around, then knock on the door, look around again. But he didn't look dangerous, so I just kept walking, since I had to pass him to take the street that would take me to my house. When I was about 10 meters away, he looked my way and started walking towards me. He was tall and slender and was carrying what looked to be a box of candy. He asked me if I had any coins to spare. I told him, sorry mate, I only have my dog's poopy bags. Have a good one. And I was ready to keep walking when he saw one of my tattoos and stopped me. For context, I have tattoos. I'm not heavily tatted, but I have several on my arms and legs, and since I was wearing shorts, the ones on my legs were visible. This specific one he was looking at was a ghost woman in a traditional Japanese style. As he stopped me, he said, That's a really cool tattoo. Would you give it to me? I laughed uncomfortably, thinking he was joking, but he was dead serious, just staring and blinking at my tattoo. He then continued talking. No? So you're just gonna let the maggots eat it? Such a shame. It'd be better if a person ate it. At this point, he raised his face and looked me straight in the eyes with a very flat smile that seemed to be an attempt to be friendly, but it only made me feel even more uncomfortable. He then asked me for my name, and not wanting to antagonize him, I gave him a fake one. Let's say it was Regina. He then asked me if I lived in town, to which I lied and said I was from the big city and just visiting. He then told me that he used to live in the city too, that he lived on the streets downtown. He told me that he used to rap on the buses to get money and just out of the blue started rapping about me, still looking me straight in the eyes. He rapped about how I was very pretty, how amazing my tattoos are, and in his rap he said my name was Lorena. I corrected him and said my name was Regina and not Lorena since I had a suspicion that he realized I'd given him a fake name and was trying to test me. He just smiled and nodded. He then asked me if I'd give him my number. I said that me and my dogs had to go home, that we were expected. He pointed at a butcher shop a block away and told me that we could sit over there while I gave him my number, that it wouldn't take long. But I told him I couldn't that the one waiting for me at home was my boyfriend. But I was lying again, since I was home alone. His smile faded a bit, and he just said, Well, that sucks. I wished him a good evening and turned around to leave, only for him to drop on his knees and grab my leg with both hands. He started caressing my tattoo while whispering, It's really a goddamn cool tattoo. My dogs are pretty friendly and were very calm during the whole exchange, but when he grabbed my legs, they started growling. I pulled my leg out of his hand, wished him a good evening again and just walked away as fast as I could. I took the longer way home to make sure he didn't follow me. Once I was home, I showered and scrubbed my leg real well since I felt gross after all that. Luckily for me, I haven't seen him again. But for a while after that, I made sure I would cover my tattoos every time I went outside, just in case.
So this one time, I was playing with my toys in the basement of my parents' house. I was around six years old, so this happened in 2011. For context, at this time the house was not fenced, and it happened a few times that people just walked through my garden to access the field behind my house. So this could be not unusual, but wait for it. After eating dinner, my parents would let me play with my toys for a little while, since it was Halloween vacation. I can't say for sure what time it was, but it was definitely after 7 p.m. because I remembered that it was already dark outside. While I was playing, I heard a noise coming from, I thought at the time, the boiler room that was behind me. It usually makes noises, so I continued to play without even thinking about it. The door of the boiler room was closed like always. It was always closed, or else you could smell it through the whole house. Anyway, I continued serving plastic food to my non-existent clients in my non-existent restaurant. Then I heard another noise. That time, I turned around to see what made the noise and where it came from, but nothing. The door to the boiler room is still closed like it's supposed to. I was confused, but didn't worry more than that and continued playing until I heard a knocking coming from the window facing me. There was a man standing there looking at me. The guy had his head between the bars of the window, and still to this day I could recognize him even if it happened 15 years ago. He was wearing this 90s Nike jacket and a faded blue cap. He had a two day old beard and he looked like he was very tired. I remember him having massive dark circles under his eyes. His expression was neutral when I noticed him. After a few seconds, I ran upstairs to my parents, telling them what I just saw. My dad immediately ran down to the basement. He grabbed a hammer and got out ready to attack the guy if needed, but the guy had disappeared into the darkness. My dad went to drive around the small village I live in to look for him, but we never saw him again. We believe he probably ran through the fields behind my house. These events honestly traumatized me. I was having a lot of nightmares, dreaming of this almost every night for a while. I had night terrors because of this, and to this day I'm still terrified when I'm in the basement. It just gives me the chills and makes me want to run upstairs as quickly as I can. So man, through the window, if you read this, thanks for scaring the shit out of me. I hope you had fun watching me play. I dated this man for about two and a half years and he nearly killed me. Very physically abusive, emotionally, sexually, all of it. The last time he hurt me was because I told him I was moving and I was going to have a roommate. He didn't like that. He strangled me twice and punched me in the face. I escaped and called the cops. He was arrested a few days later. Until then though. He was coaching me on how I needed to go back to law enforcement and state that I hit myself and he didn't really strangle me, that I stopped taking my psychiatric medicine and that I was having a psychotic break that night. At the first hearing, I recanted and told the judge all the lies my ex told me to. The judge believed me and he was set to get released from jail, but he was still under the state county hold or something like that. Before he was supposed to get released, I went back to law enforcement after gaining some clarity and told them the truth again, in which another hearing was scheduled. Undoubtedly, my ex was notified the reason why another hearing was being scheduled. He was a gang member. Obviously, I'm not going to say which one. And as previously mentioned, by now I had moved into a new house with my roommate. But before he got arrested, he asked me where I was moving and I told him which street corner the house was on, very stupidly. Well, my roommate's boyfriend at the time was affiliated as well. We were with some real winners, huh? And he was apparently notified that my house had been marked by the gang members my ex belonged to. And that showed true. One morning around 6am, my roommate and her boyfriend were sitting in the driveway in the car with the lights off. I was inside the house asleep. A car pulled up in front of the house, blocking the driveway, preventing my roommate from pulling her car out. We are still unsure whether or not these people initially knew there were people sitting in my roommate's car. 
The mystery car sat there blocking the driveway for a few minutes before a man got out of the passenger seat and began walking directly up the driveway to my porch. Luckily, my roommate's boyfriend had a gun on him, and since he saw the man walking towards the front door, he got out of my roommate's car and flashed his gun at the man. The man saw it and ran back to the car, which sped off. Maybe a few weeks later, I had driven to a gas station a few streets over after the sun had gone down. I was getting a vape or something. When I was walking back to my car, a man in the same car that was in front of my house pulled up next to me and started yelling something. I couldn't tell what he was saying before I just yelled back, shut the fuck up and leave me alone, thinking I was just being randomly catcalled. I got out of my car and went to pull out of the gas station, noticing his car sitting in front of the exit I was going to take and not moving. So I went out a different exit and turned back onto the street my house was on. I looked behind me and saw that he was following me. He waited for me to leave before he pulled out and followed behind me. I started going down different streets and he kept tailing. So eventually I freaked out and sped up real fast and made a quick impulsive turn that threw him off my tracks. I didn't go home. Another day, I came home from work and saw that the window in our dining room that looks out to the backyard, the only window on the first story that doesn't have iron bars, had been tampered with from outside. I had a screen secured to it so that the window may be opened and the screen had been ripped off. We reattached it and tried to replicate it by ripping it off ourselves, and it was hard. My roommate's boyfriend was able to, but we weren't strong enough. It would have taken a lot of effort to get that screen off. The last instance, my roommate's boyfriend and his friend had left our house to go on a walk. As they were walking back up to the house, they saw two men peeking through our other dining room window, trying to see inside. They noticed my roommate's boyfriend as he started yelling at them, asking what the fuck they were doing, and they scurried off. My ex's final hearing happened a few months ago and I've gotten him locked up until 2036. I think maybe his fellow gangbangers have realized that a man locked up for the next 12 years is not worth risking their freedom over anymore, and I have since been left alone.